Middle School 223 has become one of the top schools in the South Bronx and the 10th best middle school in the entire city. It's a huge honor for me to welcome to Connecting for Change, Ramon Gonzalez. I think that worked for Victor Cruz. I was hoping it worked for me too. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me, um, the Marion Institute, um, Cal, and uh, the great team he has assembled um, for this timely subject of urban reform. Um, I also uh, want to just thank the speakers that were here tonight. I mean, let's give them a round of applause. They were amazing. I actually told Cal that uh, I was going to be the fastest speaker here, um, but on my way um, out, he looked at me and said, you're a South Bronx principal, and we looked at each other and we said, that's probably not going to happen. So we'll, we'll move on, but at least I tried, right? Um, this is also a bit of a, ho a welcoming home for me, um, coming out to Massachusetts. You see, I went to a boarding school in Massachusetts uh, to Concord, uh, Massachusetts, a school called Middlesex. And that experience, oh, we got some middle sex folks. And that experience influenced me deeply, and it probably was the beginning of my activism. You see, when you take a child from an urban neighborhood, and the next month he's in one of the most elite institutions in the nation, um, it's going to be a little interesting. Um, but it wasn't as difficult as taking that Greyhound bus back home. And when every time I came home, I was worried about who would had died who was shot, who was in a wheelchair, because I had grew up in New York during the crack days. So that, that experience is what influenced my activism, um, led me to become a college activist and become eventually a principal um, in the South Bronx. Um, and I chose the title for this um, discussion or speech um, based on Tupac Shakur's poem. And it's because I want to challenge everyone in this audience to look a little closer at our disadvantaged kids in our urban schools, not as the problem, but as undiscovered roses that need you, everyone in here, as a role model to help them discover their roots and provide intellectual and experiential nourishment to help them grow and to be strong contributors as well. So now we all know that educating children and youth is a global imperative. Ensuring the academic success of all students is necessary to meet the growing needs of this dynamic global economy and to promote individuals' well-being and quality of life. We also all know that academic achievement can also promote social mobility. That is, education can improve not only an individual's life chances, but also the conditions of future generations, right? Better educated parents generally have children who are healthier, who perform better at school, and who have better label, labor market outcomes. So I think we all need to be involved in this. And I would say that there has been no greater place to study ed reform than New York City between advantage and disadvantaged kids. You see, New York City has 1.2 million kids. In New York City, we have communities of the richest and the poorest who live side by side and under the same education system, but with distinct results. According to the Schott Foundation, which released this study last year, New York City school system is so segregated that now it depends on what your zip code is is what your fate will be. And if so, if you happen to live in almost any zip code in the Bronx, your education fate is sealed. My goal today is to share our history, our struggles and success, and how we were able to resist that fate and become change agents for our kids. As Frederick Douglass once stated, because no matter what our circumstances is, it is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. Wow. 
I like those moves. Now, today in popular media, you know, we all love this image of the superhero, right? Rescuing the innocent children from poor public schools or the inspirational halftime speech that motivates an underachieving faculty to push themselves to new heights and turn around a failing school? Well, that superhero only exists in movies. The reality is that all the progress that we have made and every other school that I've seen has made has been around the community. And I'm talking about the teachers, the parents, the social workers who took a stand and said, we're not gonna tolerate this for my kid or for anyone's kid. An unselfish act and commit a substantial part of their lives to ensuring that children, our children, all our children, from low-income families have the same quality experiences in school as their more wealthy peers. Now I'm passionate about this because I've also grown up in a similar situation to most of the kids I serve. I grew up in East Harlem in an old tenement building, the one you see there, to a family of six brothers and sisters, and obviously a poor family. Now normally people have experienced segregation in like regions of the US, in some towns. Well, I've experienced segregation in the city block that I lived in. You see on one side of the street sat older buildings with broken windows and doors were all were, were broken doors and filled with poor folks and folks of color. And on the other side of the street was the middle class who tended to be white. And people from the right, the right side of the street, literally, never let their kids play with the people on the other side of the street. And so for years, I never even went across the street. Now, can you imagine 25 feet, never going across? And although we thought we were brave, right? We were the rough kids, we were the welfare kids. We, the kids played in the street sewer to sewer but never once, as we're throwing balls or playing around, did we ever touch that other side of the sidewalk. And then it was one day that um, I was leaving the building with my mom, and we were going to a clinic, and she said, Papi, did you ever think about living on the other side of the street? And I swear to that moment, the world was black and white, and it became color. Because I never, I, th this was my experience, this side of the street. I didn't have an experience on the other side. But for the, when she told me that, I wanted to be on the other side. And so it took me about 20 years, and I finally purchased the what was a term of endearment called the ugly puke green building, because that's the only one I could afford. Um, and you know, I'm from a Latin family, I'm Puerto Rican and Cuban, and of course we like to have our parties with music. I mean, everything's all around music. And there you go. And, um, and sure enough, um, I asked my mom to come over. I made her a nice apartment to come, you know, live with me because um, she wanted to be on the other side of the street. And uh, she looked at the apartment. She said, Papi, are you crazy? I have a five-bedroom rent-stabilized apartment over there, and you want me to live in this little place? But really what she was saying was, I just want to know if it could be done. Many of our families want to know if it could be done, too. It became my challenge and our school's challenge to show others that it could be done. Now our job as educators, social workers, community partners is to find ways to make our schools better, our children smarter, and communities stronger. Yet our system is still divided between those children who have strong family advocates, great mom, dad, uncles, and those without. Some of us even practice this bigotry of low expectations where we believe separating kids somehow, whether it's this side of the street or that side of the street, whether it's this side of school or that side of school, is gonna make our society better. Or we go for the easy one, right? We just simply blame parents. I mean, that is the easy part. But too many students are still disengaged from school and still failing across our country. But as I like to remind everyone, we're all only nine meals away from being in that same position. The good news is that we can change that. And I've seen the evidence from my experience as a New York City principal, um, and today we're gonna talk about that. Let me catch you up here. At MS223, the Laboratory School of Finance and Technology in District 7, 
located in the South Bronx, I remind myself every day of 23. And I'm not talking about 23, my favorite Yankee, Don Mattingly. I know, I know, we're not here. Or my favorite baseball, basketball player, Michael Jordan. Sadly, it is also the proficiency rate for reading of children in the South Bronx. Coincidentally, 23 is also the percent of city students who leave our public school and are prepared to succeed in college. The symbol of this poor reading environment for years was our library. When we started our school, our school was considered the most dangerous middle school in New York. And the library was the greatest example of that because instead of having books, it was just a big empty room. And it became the detention center until we took over the school. Um, according to President Obama, we are failing too many of our children. We are sending them out into 21st century economy by sending them through the doors of 20th century schools. So there also exists this group of kids in all schools, but especially in those early days of our school, I like to call them the I bendito kids. Now you know the I bendito kids. Those kids who that we feel sorry for, but never take any action, that roam around our hallways, the troubled children with emotional needs, but everyone wants them out their school, or those kids that have great academic needs, yet are taught the same way with less expectations in some isolated area in the building. Or I like to call them quiet troubles. Those are those kids who know and have learned that being quiet means to go unchallenged in the classroom. Those are the ay bendito kids. Or as my mom would say, ay bendito. Some have even thought that if you can't get rid of those kids, maybe we can quarantine them in some place in the district. But as we know, we have to stop saying those kids. They are our kids. And we started to believe we could change the fate of our kids. At MS223, we have an extraordinary academic program that was rated in the top 3% of all progress reports on the middle school and elementary level, and which garnered the 2010 Intel Schools of Distinction Award in mathematics out of 1,100 schools. We also won the Spanish Government School of the Year Award. But that's not what changed our school. Our attitudes about our kids changed our school. So instead of constantly blaming our kids, we started to look at us and say, what are we doing for our kids? You see, at MS223, we just started looking and moving away from this idea of an um, academic achievement gap, and we started looking at this idea of an experience gap. Now, according to researchers, including Richard Rothstein, Ronald Ferguson, Susan Newman, and alluded to recently by President Obama, highly qualified instruction, which you hear all through the media, right? Everybody needs the greatest teachers in the world may only influence 30% of the achievement gap. This is what research is called in-school factors. But we've also realized that out-of-school opportunities as well is what we want to work on in our schools. We realize that addressing these experience gaps requires a staff that is committed to going beyond the classroom and addressing the many gaps that influence why our children continue to fall behind their more economically advantaged peers. Now I'm thankful to tell you that my school is, all we do is create activists. And that's why we went to close that gap. So we began to get to work. And it took us some time. In our first year, our students were at 7% percentile in math and ELA, and these were the kids coming to us that year. The next year, they went up to 13%. In 2006, they reached 29%. Let me catch you guys up there. You gotta be fast readers here, right? Um, and by 2010, we have reached 75%. Then we started to go a little down. And why did we go down? Because we became so successful that the district doubled the amount of special needs kids we had which is great because that's what we're in this business for. So I'm, I'm not complaining, that's what we do. Now how do we do it? In English, we implemented a community literacy campaign.
There we go. That was actually our math gross. And just so I, I could show you, if you notice, the blue is MS223, the red is the city scores, and the yellow is the neighborhood schools where our school is located. So just so you can see the difference. And just so you know, you know, one of the things that are happening in our country is that a lot of our schools are getting kids to graduate, but they're still not preparing them for college. What this statistic shows you is that this is a ninth grade exam that eighth graders in my school are taking. And you can see how many other kids in the city are taking that, eighth grade exam, that ninth grade exam. So it tells you the rigor in the school. And I just put this picture in here because these kids look cute. <laughs> so we decided to do this community campaign um, where we had, we started just purchasing lots and lots of books from donors and we wanted to flood our classrooms with books. And we started to also do what we call a call to the community. We saw the data of how important it was for parents to have access to reading materials, which is key to addressing that experience gap and to read with their children. So we put books in bodegas and laundry mats. See that, that's a sea town. And we replenished them every two weeks and called every family in our schools to grab a book and read with their kids every Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Now we just didn't call the kids from our families. We then asked the other principals to do it because this can't, you can't change a community if you're only concerned about your school. So this became our call to action. We also asked our local doctors, we have several clinics in the area, to also start reading with our kids. So after they do a doctor's appointment, they were expected to read at least a page with the kids, and the doctors were into this. It was kind of interesting. Um, and why was this a, a, a strategy that we used? Because we saw that our parents trusted our doctors more than they trusted the school. And so we felt if we can get the doctors to read to the kids, the parents are gonna take that to the next level. We also expect that all of our teachers to show that they were reading as well. So every teacher is expected to read a book and kids are able to go up to the teacher and ask them what they've read. Because we didn't want teachers just telling kids to read. We want them to be models of readers. And we knew that kids read because adults read and we wanted all the cool adults reading with kids. So we decided to focus on other outside factors and this is when sort of the, the net grows. So to deal with the health gap in our school, we worked on several tasks. We brought in Helen Keller International to give all of our children eyesight screenings and glasses on the spot. Now the reality is a lot of our kids get screening for eyesight. They just don't get the glasses. So we want to take that excuse away. And what was fascinating about this is that when we did it, you know, everybody was like, why are you doing this? It's a waste of time. You're going to get 10% kids, 20. We had 30 to 40% of our kids who needed glasses. And here we are talking about discipline and we have kids who can't see the board. We changed all the lights. We wrote a grant, spent 50,000 to change all the lights in the schools because in New York City, what the custodians would do would turn down the wattage and it would be dim in the hallways. And we said, if we're about literacy and about reading, we need to make sure this is the brightest place and we want our kids awake in the school day. Please don't put our kids to sleep. So that's when we changed the lights. We partnered with Mount Sinai Hospital to provide our kids and their families with mental health services. It's a mental health crisis in our urban areas. And we need to make sure we're pushing the mental health services. We meet weekly to systemically improve our social workers and programs with a new model called Solution Focused Counseling. I strongly suggest that in any school, move away from focusing on the past and let's start working on kids solving problems. To empower students with strategies and check-ins to solve problems in their own lives. And to deal with the role model gap, we sought to hire men of color because we felt there were so few of them in our teaching staff uh, who are expected to dress just like teachers, who are expected to participate in, the, in our kids' daily lives, and are expected to lead mentoring classes as, as well as um, women for our black and Latino boys. We felt like we wanted strong role models um, throughout our school. To deal with the college gap, and these are all the gaps that I'm just reinforcing to you, we continue to organize overnight trips to several universities, including Harvard, UPenn, Yale, Cornell, Rutgers, Stony Brook, and Georgetown. Now the trick is, do not just take them for the day. They need to see college like you saw college, which was not always about academics, right? 
you saw how to be an individual, you saw how to network, those are the pieces that our kids sorely need. They do not see those pieces on a daily basis. And then to deal with, that was our college trip. Then we came up with this system called school bucks. And one of the issues we have in our urban neighborhoods is that everybody rents, no one owns. So if you want people to own, you have to teach them how to own. So we decided to create a simulated economy within the school. And the way it works is that teachers give out two school bucks based on our school values. Kids can save it. We have a school bank. We have a school store. We have school jobs. Kids can save it to buy the uniform if they don't have the money for the uniform or other things. Um, and if you want to go to the school dance or be on the VIP uh, seating arrangement in our school dance, you got to pay in school bucks. Um, we redefine parent involvement by engaging parents at their home with activities instead of judging them based on who has the ability to take time off and volunteer at school. We build pride in our students by treating language as an asset, creating a dual language program that was recently honored, as I said, by the Spanish Embassy as one of three national recognized Colegio de Año, or School of the Year. There we go. And to deal with the summer learning loss gap, we created a hybrid summer camp. So here's the issue. A lot of our kids take the summer off, and guess what? The, high, the countries in the world that are doing the best, Finland, the Asian countries, our kids are in summer school. So our kids are going at the same rate, but they're, they're already behind because they're missing more school than other kids. So we decided we can't do it for everyone, but we can do it for the kids who are the most disadvantaged, we decided to make summer school manda mandatory in our school. And the way we did that was not only to make it about academics, we wanted to make it like a camp. So we used the, summer, the academic courses to prep our kids so that they stay on level in academics. And then we used art in our sports league to get the kids into the school to want to learn about their health and how to eat and, and, and enrich other enrichments. So Joe, can you put that video on? I'm going to show you a little video. The, the kids that are participating here are incoming sixth graders. And basically, uh, from my personal experience working in, in, in these uh, areas of the city, uh, with the type of organization that I am, if, if it wasn't for organizations uh, like Yale, th this would not happen. The Summer Institute for the Arts was started to bring programs like this to communities that usually don't have them. Performing arts, creative arts, even film and dance. And so what we like to do is fund these programs that don't have the financial backing over the summertime. I like the Yale Summer Institute for the arts because we have a lot of things to do over the summer and we kind of have an uh, interest in music and art and they kind of blend it all together. Instead of, you know, just telling you what they do, they show you things and like you learn more and more things each day. Every day you come here. I think like it's exciting, it's like exciting, it's like a best way to like enjoy your summer. I'm doing the Yale Summer Institute for Art because I really like music and I want to learn different types of them. You learn while you're having fun. You have like teachers who really help you with what you're going to do and it's very interesting because you get to like do what you want but in the same way making like what the same thing everybody else is making. The way the arts situation is right now in the uh, New York City Department of Education, which I would say is basically non-existent, um, it's up to other organizations such as uh, Yale Alumni, um, ourselves, Multicultural Music Group, to uh, try to provide uh, students with this, this missing part of, of their lives that in many instances can transform, change, and, and sometimes even save lives. People should have music in their life because if you don't have music in your life, you're gonna have misery every day. Like when I'm angry, like really, really angry, I just have to turn on the radio and just like listen to music and just lock the doors and be by myself. That, it really calms me down. I don't know why. I don't know how it calms me down, but it really does. It really works. I do think the consistent attention 
that the children have gotten this summer and maybe will get next summer and just throughout their lives. This is one of the, the pebbles that will go to, you know, contribute to the rest of their lives. So to me, it's more, uh, more important that they have a continued, sustained feeling of self and um, self-expression and understand the importance of creativity because at the very least, I think that this program does that. What, before we do uh, art before music and we learned about different art, um, different people like Matisse, Sonia and Robert Delaunay. We learned a lot about who they were and what was their style of art. It's like really interesting to learn and kind of copy their, the example that they set and like they inspire us. To have a structured event for them that is engaging them in both the arts and literacy um, is going to help them change their lives. And for a lot of kids, they don't re realize that. Um, you know, we, we would normally say literacy for life. Um, I think now we might change it to arts for life. These students are coming to junior high school for the first time. Before they're even entering junior high school, they are being exposed to um, different types of music, to uh, musical instruments, and to musical knowledge. And by the time they leave here, uh, even though it's a you know, three-week program, by the time they leave here, they will have, an, have had an overview of all the different uh, sections of the orchestra. They'll have had a chance to listen to uh, all the different uh, instruments in the orchestra and to play an instrument of their choice. Like just now, I switched from guitar to piano because the, the guitar, it kind of hurts my fingers. I like the guitar, but I like the piano more because I want to go on America's Got Talent, and it runs in my family, so that's why I like the piano instead of the guitar. I like playing piano, so I want to play in like Central Park, uh, you know, like those little bands that they play in Central Park, yeah. Nobody else was playing the trombone, so I just decided I would try the trombone before I go to guitar. And now um, I really like trombone and I don't want to go to guitar no more. Play something? Yeah. Kind of comes out squeaky since I'm just learning right now. <laughs> and learning about the different instruments and how you play it is really fun because you get to know d different stuff and you get a break from the school stuff during the, the day and kind of, it's like something you want to do every day. Being from Ohio, I just sort of took for granted took it, it was, that it would be a matter of course that every public school child would have access to the arts in school. And I was just sort of astounded to discover that that's not the case in the state of New York. I, I, I think it's amazing that the Yale Black Alumni Association and the Yale uh, AYA you know, have the heft to be able to pull something like this off. And, New York public schools, the children are excited, the volunteers are excited, the, the teaching staff is excited, um, and, and it just makes all of us excited, so I'm really happy about that. Right now, we'd, we'd love for other arts programs and the arts community in general to know that we exist. We're a small program, we have, uh, we're at MS-223 right now, we're also at the Lenox School District in LA. We'd like to bring these programs all, all throughout the United States and get some real support from the music and arts community. So we're trying to get the word out, if you'd like to volunteer with us, please contact us, go online, we're at Yale Summer Institute for the Arts, take a look at what we're doing, and if you'd like to, to join us, please do. We'd love to have you as a supporter. All right. I'm, I'm not sure if he was a DJ in the past, or that transition. Um, but I, I want to thank you for listening to our story, and allowing me to share our desire to relentlessly keep pursuing improvement for our children. Now, according to Nelson Mandela, there is no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. So I challenge you to keep believing by raising expectations for all kids and building those relationships in your community and school. Let's move to grow roses, not on testing metrics, but by cheering how many adults engage our students when they walk into that building each morning, or how many students successfully eat their lunch, or have time to play at recess, or how many students are smiling at the end of the day. 
where I bendito kids no longer exist. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you. Okay, so we've heard today how hatred and violence can rip communities apart. We've also heard how things like food, music, dance, and education can heal them and make them more resilient. It's all connected, okay? This is Bioneers. This is Connecting for Change. The Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School is gonna be leading everyone to lunch outside just in front of the theater in their trashin fashion. Please take note of their creativity and feel free to ask questions about their outfits. Go enjoy lunch. Keep talking to folks you've never met before. Keep going to workshops you'd never imagined you'd go to. Keep connecting. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.